Hello everyone. Today's lesson is about pens and about ink and inking. So today you're going to need inking pens. Inking pens. If you don't have inking pens, you can use just ordinary pen and some black Indian ink. If you don't have black Indian ink, you can use just any kind of paint, acrylic or watercolor to replace that. Also, before we start the lesson, I've been noticing that I keep asking everyone to comment and no one's commenting. And I know people are watching because I can see views on the video, but they're not commenting. So, please comment either right now and just say, I'm here, so I know that you're watching the video, and YouTube isn't just making random views pop up that don't exist. Now we will go on with the lesson, so let's go. The first thing I want to teach you is varied line, and for that I'm going to use this number 8 fiber tips pen. You can also use a quill pen, but I'm very bad at using quill pens, so I use these. So whenever you use very line, it's about lifting, about having different thicknesses of line to show weight in an object. If you have a really thick pen, you can lift or press harder or lighter on the pen to have a different thickness or you can even go back like this and add some thickness to the line like this. I'm making the lines thicker down here because at the bottom it will give the apple more weight. That is very line. The next technique I want to teach you is hatching, which is all parallel lines. Come on, line, get in there. That which are closer together to show darkness and farther apart to show lightness. And you see that none of these lines here intersect one another. They're not crossing over each other. Because then that would be cross hatching, which is the next part. But the closer you put them together, the darker it is. But cross hatching and just normal hatching are really best used when they're used together. So I'm having a hard time kind of draw a picture without using cross hatching too, but just hatching. And you can see how the lines are closer together here to show the shadow and farther apart here and here to show the highlights in the flower. So that is hatching. Okay, the next technique I have for you is hatching and hatching is very similar to the last thing we did why is my pen going now oh my gosh it died there we go it's parallel lines like this but you can go and you cross over them like this let me show you right here. Let me get the bigger pen. So this would just be the hatching. But when you start making it cross hatching, you go across like this. And you can go across like this. And like this. And you can make the lines closer or farther apart when you're hatching. 
to create different darkness versus lightness in your picture. And also, if you're doing a curved drawing like this, sometimes it helps to curve your lines to give it a more curved effect. So there is cross hatching. The next technique I want to teach you is stippling. Stippling, not stippling. I keep on saying stippling, but stippling, which is literally using just teeny tiny dots, like that, just a thousand teeny tiny dots like a printer, to create um, values and highlights. And, um,. The closer you put the dots together, the darker your shadows will be, and then the farther you put them apart, the lighter the shadows will be. You have to be very patient with this technique because it takes a freakishly long time. Okay, a thousand years later, and I'm finally done with the stippling. So you can see, I'm making the dots closer and farther apart, and create shadows and highlights. And this is an orange, and um, I thought it would be good to pick an orange for this example since I already got a bumpy surface and stippling sort of creates a bumpy surface but you can see sort of how you could use an even smaller pen than this one this is number five but you could use an even smaller pen and spend hours and hours and you could create like a hyper realistic effect on something that looks like it was done by a printer because printers actually that's how they do is a bunch of little dots so it's very similar to how a printer works so that is stippling and now we're going to move on to the brush techniques so get your things together we are gonna do that now First technique is known as solid fill. So you're going to take your solid black ink and you're going to make fill in whatever you want to be solid black of your picture. And it's called solid fill because there's no gradient, it's not going to be lighter in some places or darker in another, it's just going to be solid. Sometimes the ink is a little bit thin, so you need to go over it again. So that's solid fill, 
And the next one is ink wash. I did an ink wash next. It's where you'll get use water to basically change the color or the tone of the ink. Whenever you do this, you can test it on the paper. You usually have a test paper. See if it's what you want. You're like, okay, it's the color I want. And you can use it to shade your drawing. This is actually what I use or do to shade my comic book that I am making super slowly because I don't have that much time to work on it. There. Now you can see better. I'm testing this on the paper. There, I'll show you. It doesn't look quite dark enough. I'm going to add some more ink to it. This is all I'm doing. It. There. Now I need a little bit darker, but I'm running out of ink, so I'm going to get some more. started out doing a lighter tone, like a more watered down ink, and then I moved on to darker ink to create the look that I wanted. So you can use toning, it's very good for shading a drawing to create a sort of um, computer shading look. Let me do more shading right here. And I think it just looks really nice to me. There you go. Okay, the last technique is um, using a split brush. So it's getting some dry ink. Let's see if this is dry enough. Splitting your brush like this. So little pieces kind of apart. And then using it to create this effect, which can be used for wood or fur or anything that you can think of. And I'm going to use it to um, texture this tree I drew. So you can see the brush is split and it creates this sort of effect. You can see it a little closer now. And I think I need to get more ink on here because it's looking kind of messed up and I'm going to try to use this I've never done this before I'm going to try to use this to create a wood effect on this going out of bounds no don't go out of bounds right there you see it going out of bounds and it's just me not ever practicing this that would have been a good idea. Practice before you try to teach people what you're doing. Yeah. Need to get some more ink. It's all gone. But it needs to be dried out, so I'm putting it on this napkin. Splitting it here. Testing it. Okay, it looks the same. Trying not to go out of bounds. And yet, still going out of bounds. I think this this technique is probably a lot easier for fur, which doesn't matter as much if you go out of bounds. But I wanted to try it on wood. So when I saw it, I was like, "Whoa, that would look great for wood." And now I see. It's not as good as I thought it would be. But it's still pretty good. So 
that's the split brush effect. And you can see all of these together now. And this will be good for flowers too. Most of these techniques are best used together. So if you want to create like a really dynamic picture or with the most realistic, uh, a realistic picture, it's best to use them all together and even use some hatching techniques from the other thing with it. It's a good idea too. When you're done, don't forget to clean your brushes with soap and water, whether you're using ink or acrylic or watercolor as your toning thing to use.